welcome everybody to this what does zero carbon mean for the transport in the UK webinar um, with green, the greenhouse think tank and the Green European Foundation. Um, I was going to introduce myself, but actually you can see there's a nice slide up there uh, telling you uh, what you need to know. I come to you actually very fresh from um, just being taking part in the environment bill debate in the House of Lords. So I've been focusing a bit on nature. So I'm doing a mental mind shift from land use to transport. Uh, but it is always one of my, uh, my favourite issues and something I spend a lot of time on. Um, what we've got coming up this evening, um, many people might have already seen the timetable. We've, we've got three speakers and then a Q&A session. But as always, um, those who get in early in the Q&A have by far the best chance of getting their questions put forward and answered. Um, so as questions occur to you through the presentations, please do put them in the Q&A box. Um, we've also got a chat box where people can have discussions, introduce each other, uh, talk about what's, uh, what's being discussed. So both of those options are available to make this as interactive as possible in our virtual world. What we're also going to do is conduct some short polls through the meeting. Uh, so we'll explain a little bit more about those when we get to them. Um, and just to very briefly outline, this is a three year project run by Greenhouse and the Green European Foundation, which is the umbrella group for green think tanks um, from across Europe, um, which uh, Greenhouse is still part of despite Brexit. Um, and to explain a little bit more about the project, um, I'm going to hand you over to Peter Sims, who's an electrical engineer who specialises in systems engineering, and he coordinates the Climate Emergency Economy Project for Greenhouse. So over to you, Peter. Thank you, Natalie. Just to give a brief overview of the project. So uh, as Natalie said, it's a transnational project um, involving partners from across Europe, and it's coordinated and um, funded by the Green European Foundation. Um, Greenhouse is a UK partner, but there are partners uh, in, in multiple other countries across Europe. Um, and the focus of the project is really what does the economy need to look like in order for us to respond sufficiently to the climate emergency? Um, and that transport is obviously one area of that we're going to be exploring today. So just to give you a brief overview of some of the previous things that we've done and how this event fits into the, the broader work this year in the run up to COP26. Uh, so these are the, the first three publications Greenhouse has put out as part of this um, uh, part of this project. So the first one was on trade, the second one was on infrastructure, and then the last one was on uh, how the climate emergency fits in with the other planetary boundaries and how these ne challenges need to be seen together, and then what the social consequences as well as you know requirements are as well as the environmental ones are. And together those three reports outline uh, the zero carbon policy toolkit, which we'll come on to a bit later. Um, so uh, the top left show, just shows you the, is the zero carbon policy toolkit, a little overview of that, it's made up of blockers of enablers and gives an, a high level summary of what we think the policy interventions are. Um, we, there is also a webinar we did last year on trade and some, um, and some gifts on our website, so if anyone who hasn't seen our previous work um, uh, on this project for which this sort of leads on from, um, uh, please do go and have a look at either the Greenhouse Think Tank website or the, the jeff.eu website. Um, for more information. So this year the research on this project has three pillars, the first which, of which is transport infrastructure investment which is being led by Greenhouse in the UK. There's another pillar on the role of hydrogen in a climate emergency economy um, and another pillar looking at food sovereignty and regional resilience. Um, but this webinar is on transport investment and infrastructure so I will uh, hand back to Natalie for some interesting speakers. Thank you very much. I'll just note that um, following on from what Peter said, I can com particularly commend the work um, done on steel in that trade report and it's something I cite very often um, that about four fifths of the waste steel in the UK is actually currently exported um, to markets with very poor carbon records to be recycled. And if we were to actually recycle that steel here in the UK with renewable uh, powered um, arc furnaces, then we'd essentially meet our steel needs. But given we've got so much to get through this evening, um, I'm going to be um, go straight on to um, introducing our keynote speaker for this evening, um, Professor Julian Allwood, who's the Professor of Engineering and Environment at the University of Cambridge, and he leads the Users Less Group which does world leading research into the sustainable use of materials, energy and resources. And I do think, Julian, you should perhaps have a chat uh, to Zach Goldsmith and the government, because um, I've been working on an amendment to the Environment Bill, which basically says 
um, currently says we'll use resources more efficiently. And I'm trying to put down amendments saying, well, actually, we'll use less resources. So um, something you might like to feed into later. Um, Julian is a, a lead author at the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and of the UK fires report Absolute Zero. Incidentally, the report on that was one of the first debates I ever took part in in the House of Lords, which describes how the UK would operate with zero emissions by 2050 without relying on as yet under, uh, unscaled energy sector or negative emissions technologies. So what Julian's going to do for us tonight is look at what needs to change in the transfer of goods and people to meet a real, not zero carbon in the UK and EU. So that's over to you, Julian. Great, thanks very much indeed, um, Natalie. Thanks to Peter for operating this. I'm really delighted to be here and um, warmly share with you the agenda of all the workshops that Peter just uh, highlighted. UK Fires is a uh, five year, six million pound research program with many universities and companies involved, trying to explore um, very similar questions um, and particularly trying to look at opportunities where businesses can grow while taking a real view of what zero emissions means. Um, just in the warm up to giving the talk, I discovered the talk was going to be uh, recorded, which I didn't know. So I have to hold back from some of the work in progress I was going to tell you about. Um, but I hope I can at least give you a good overview of how we're thinking about the problem at the moment. Um, Peter, could you please click the next slide? I've got three of these subtitles in the talk, uh, the first of which is to talk about false hope. So on the next slide, we are very clearly in the era of false hope at the moment, and we've been there for about 30 years, since the beginning of 1990. Uh, we've had um, the various reports of the IPCC, uh, a lot of political action, a lot of meetings. The IPCC got the Nobel Peace Prize. Lots of famous and important people have flown around the world and talked about a lot of things. And as you can see on the graph, global emissions have steadily gone up and up and up. Um, I picked out the two gents on the right as representative of what happens in every country that gets it with climate change. Um, the first thing they do is make the same announcement that they're going to invent their way out of the problem. Uh, they're going to invest in R&D and then conventional innovation and entrepreneurial mechanisms are going to grow high value businesses in their country, export the solutions to the world and we will find the answer. So John Kerry made the most recent version of this statement, 50% of the reductions we'll make by 2050 will come from technologies that don't yet exist. But if you look back to what Al Gore was saying in 2007, there's kind of no change. This is just what each generation of politicians says when they first get the idea that they've actually got to do something about climate change. And unfortunately, it's not true. If we go on to the next slide, you'll see here that we've made a, um, an extensive study in our research group, and this is an academic paper that's published, I can share if it's useful on the rates at which new energy infrastructure technologies have uh, arrived in the world. So the top half of this graph shows um, four of the fastest deployments in the world, in particular nuclear power in France, wind in Denmark, and combined cycle gas turbines in the UK. Um, and the story is that on the left of the graph, to the left of the vertical axis, there's a long period from when the technology was invented up to when it reaches about 5% of its eventual market size. And during that um, period, a lot has to happen. So obviously you start with a lab demonstration, then you get pilot studies at increasing scale, connections to existing infrastructure. We have to create legal environmental permissions. We have to deal with public consent after the first accident occurs. And that's, of course, very important here. We know that the German public has turned away from nuclear power based on an accident in Japan, which, to my taste, was actually a triumph for nuclear safety. Uh, that with an unprecedented tidal wave, um, the Fukushima power station did not uh, break down. But nevertheless, the German public have turned away from nuclear power. Um, and that's all part of what gets negotiated when we bring in a new technology, as well as financing and government support and so on. When eventually the technology reaches something like 5% of the market it's entering, 
then it doesn't then grow according to the S curve. It's not an iPhone or a new printer because these are very large engineering projects. They all require government involvement and they're coming in against the lobby of an incumbent industry that has to decline. So it takes significant political capital to make one of these transitions and therefore they go pretty slowly. It's pretty rare for any transition to go faster than 2% of the eventual market size per year during that growth phase. Now, what that means is that when we are committed to uh, zero emissions by 2050 in 29 years time, we need to separate energy technologies into two buckets. One are the ones which are ready, have reached a reasonable scale and that we can deploy. So wind, solar power, nuclear power, heat pumps, building insulation and so on. And ones where we have to gain experience, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, negative emissions technologies and so on. Um, but at the moment, policy keeps getting confused by imagining that because something's happened once, then it's ready for deployment. It isn't. Climate mitigation has nothing at all to do with the Apollo program. We're not trying to put one person on the moon. We're trying to get everybody onto the moon, if you like to stretch the analogy. So carbon capture and storage has been around for 20 years, heavily funded by the oil and gas industry. They have a massive lobby supporting it. But the total global capacity is 0.1% of global emissions, anthropogenic uh, emissions. Uh, three quarters of that capacity is used for getting more oil out of the ground, and nobody at all will reveal how much of the capacity is in fact used. Capacity is the maximum rate, not what's actually happening. So um, the one of the reasons that we have this false hope is that politics has not recognized the difference between gaining experience and deploying technologies. Um, the graph also points out that very often behavior change can act faster than new technology infrastructures. And that's very obvious from what happened in lockdown. Um, moving on to the next slide, then one of the ones that's talked about at the moment, very much in the same way that the word abracadabra is used at Christmas, is hydrogen. Um, but hydrogen, you've got a report coming up on that, um, Peter just said in the introduction. I think that should be a very short report, uh, which should say no hydrogen. Uh, and the reason is that you have to make it using either electricity or carbon capture and storage. There isn't any carbon capture and storage at any significant scale, so we can rule that out. But it's a very inefficient way of transferring energy. Um, so the numbers here compare how much non-emitting electricity you need to power a car with hydrogen compared to use it with batteries. That's only three to one. Um, heating a house with a hydrogen boiler is only six times more non-emitting electricity than using a heat pump. And the example that Natalie just mentioned sounds good. Um, I think their time scale to get to industrial scale deployment is much longer than what Natalie just said. But the important point is that they say, and they're very transparent on their website about this, the process is called hybrid and they've got very good information. Um, that it takes seven times more electricity to make uh, steel from iron ore with hydrogen than it does to recycle steel by an electric arc furnace. So we've been lobbying for 10 years now for improved extended electric arc furnaces in the UK. There is no way we're going to have enough non-emitting electricity to squander it on making hydrogen. Uh, we're going to be short of electricity. Uh, so I don't believe that um, hydrogen has a, uh, a significant role. Could we go on to the next one as well? If you look at the history of the UK, then the government is very keen to tell us that the emissions of the UK have dropped by about 42% since 1990. Uh, and, um, and the GDP of the UK has grown. Those two are totally unrelated statements. Um, but you can see here that the way that we've achieved that is firstly by not accounting for anything that doesn't occur on, above or below the territory of the UK. So shutting a factory in the UK is a huge success for emissions policy. Uh, we don't count international aviation and shipping. And of course, those have both grown significantly. So the blue line is the real line of our consumption emissions rather than the red line. And the things that have worked amazingly are all um, due to either Mrs. Thatcher or the European Union. So Mrs. Thatcher's fight with the coal miners is the biggest impact, the coal to gas conversion. Um, the, the heavy industry closure obviously was also Mrs. Thatcher's um, move. 
Um, the growth in wind has been important, and that's a significant. It's reduced our emissions by about four or five percent compared to where they would have been otherwise. And the other really good one is that the European landfill tax scheme has caused us to capture methane very effectively from our landfill sites. But overall, so far, new technologies have had absolutely no impact. There are no new technologies anywhere on that graph. If we look ahead on the next slide, um, then I've put in the targets that we have uh, committed to in the UK at the moment. And these are really good. Uh, the Climate Change Act, as modified by Theresa May, says zero emissions in 2050. That's in line with cli climate science, if we make a, a linear decline to then. And the current government, who I don't feel very drawn to in any other way, has announced two targets which are absolutely compatible with that journey to zero emissions. However, as I think we all know, they have no delivery authority and it doesn't look as if they're really intending on delivering on these. Um, but the political focus, the so-called 10-point plan that's come out recently, all the dialogue that you're hearing from the government is all about energy sector innovation. Uh, that is not going to make uh, to get there. There isn't time to deploy it to get to the scale of change. So what I want to draw attention to in the next slide is um, the risk. If you think about the way that we're approaching climate change so far, we're trying to find solutions that are purely technological on the hope that the public won't notice that they're happening. The assumption is that demand should grow as if we were taking no response, taking no notice of climate change. We should find hidden technological substitutes and then the public will accept it and all will be well. Well, there is no possibility that we can do that. So in the yellow area here, I've come up with, if you like, the idea of virtuous asceticism, which I find personally appealing, but I gather it has a little political and marketing traction. So choosing less eating, choosing not to fly, giving up beef, lamb and dairy. These are absolutely the right things to do. And probably many people on this call have already uh, done that, as, as have I and my family. Um, but what we're missing on this plot is the so-called, what we've called here the missing obvious. So during the time that we've been talking about having uh, CCS and hydrogen and all the rest of it, our cars have got larger, our internal temperatures have rise, risen, and the number of flights we're taking has kept growing. Incredibly, the Climate Change Committee says even now we anticipate modest demand growth for aviation by 2050. Well, who on earth are they kidding? An airplane is nothing more than a Bunsen burner where you put in fossil fuel at one end and get emissions at the other. There are no substitutes that are going to be viable uh, over the time frame in which we have to act. So we are taking a very, very high risk approach to climate mitigation, and uh, it's time that we started waking up. I just an hour ago took a screenshot of the homepage of the Financial Times which I think is rather revealing of the fact that there is a collision coming between the false hope and the rhetoric and reality. So the current headlines on the Financial Times homepage, where one fifth of their headlines are now always on climate change, say Brussels targets aviation fuel tax in drive to reduce carbon emissions. And of course, uh, surprise, surprise, the aviation industry is unhappy. G20 ministers endorsed carbon pricing to help tackle climate change. Uh, aluminium group seeks exclusion from EU carbon border tax, all the usual sort of stuff. But the pressure is growing. The finance sector is becoming a player. It's not having much effect yet, but clients are having a big effect. I gave a talk to the uh, board of directors of the world's largest Niobium mining company, who are a big supplier to all the steel industries of the UK last month, and they are under pressure from their clients, the steel industry, who know that they are going to have to deliver much lower emissions steel. Uh, as we know, the only way to do that in reality is through recycling. And so it was a good question to discuss with them is what's the role of alloying elements in the future? So false hope so far, but there's a crunch coming. So now let's try and be a bit pragmatic as the slide says. On the next slide, if we want to have technologically uh, equivalent substitutes for today's activities, if we want the public not to notice the change that uh, zero emissions requires, we only have three resources to draw on. Those are non-emitting electricity, biomass, and negative emissions technologies. 
Those are the only three things you can use to replace today's cars, airplanes, trains, cement factories, and so on. The graph on the left shows how we're getting on in the world with supplying non-emitting electricity. It's a tiny fraction compared to other, which are the fossil fuels. The middle graph shows that the human appropriation of net primary productivity, our use of biomass, is already approaching 30% of the world's harvest. And every conservationist in the world says that we can't do that. So we cannot risk any solution that expands our use of biomass. And the graph on the right shows that negative emissions technologies are so small that we shouldn't be taking, they should never enter any policy discussion at the moment. They're totally irrelevant. And what that means is if there are no negatives, there's no automatic substitute with biomass, then net zero is absolute zero. There are no negatives. So we published our report, Absolute Zero, at the end of 2019, and it led to the debate that Natalie just mentioned in the Lords in February uh, last year. And it's had a lot of traction, um, particularly with the science community and government since then. And briefly on the next slide, to summarize what we said there, we looked at the past history of electricity in the UK. In the last decade, we've done very well in increasing our non-emitting electricity generation. And if we expand at the same rate as we've done in the last decade, which is just about what we're on course to do. The Prime Minister has announced that we're going to quadruple offshore wind by 2030. And if Hinkley Point opens on time, that will nearly keep us on that linear track, not quite. So if we expand on non-emitting electricity at the same rate, then we will have more electricity than we have today and it will all be non-emitting. But of course, we have to get rid of all other forms of energy. So we need to electrify all our demand close anything which causes emissions by its chemistry, and we'll then have about a half of the electricity that we'd like to have. So we have to reduce demand. Um, and obviously we have to cut out things that emit due to their chemistry, the hard ones being uh, cows, sheep, and cement. Uh, I put on ships and planes there because we're just not gonna have the budget, the amount of electricity to create the fuel for them to make any significant part. Okay, so moving on to now, Peter, please, to the next one. Let's start talking about transport. So in the transport sector on the next picture, here is the UK's current demand for passenger transport. So the services provided by transport are on the left here. You can see business, travel, commuting, uh, education that's getting to school, not the education of being in a car, um, leisure and so on. Um, and then you can see the different distances of the journeys and the different vehicles there. And of course, we just can't envisage a, an electrical equivalent to air and sea transport. We can uh, imagine electrifying all of the others. Um, battery powered cars, obviously what we want is small cars. At the moment, the um, average car in the UK weighs 12 and a half times as much as the people inside it. And we're driving the car with an average of 1.6 people in it, even though it has five seats. So we clearly want to increase the ratio of the weight of people to the vehicle. And that's a big growth opportunity is small vehicles, which have a much greater, um, better ratio of vehicle to, uh, of people to vehicle when we're moving them around. Uh, with trucks and heavy goods vehicles, we've got a problem because the battery mass is so gigantic. And the only viable solution on the table for that at the moment is overhead pantographs, like you use for trams. And we need to install those on the A roads, networks and motorways of the UK. Um, then uh, heavy goods vehicles and buses and coaches and so on could run like a tram on the roads and long distance journeys and then use small batteries just for the last five miles of the journey. Um, on the next slide, then we've got the uh, demand for freight. Um, I've just talked about the heavy goods vehicles here. Rail is a great opportunity, only 30, I think 35% roughly of the UK's rail network is electrified at the moment. We've got to electrify all of the rest and we could do that. That's a great um, in a infrastructure project that should be starting right now. And we've got a problem with sea and air uh, that we just don't have a way of making synthetic fuels to do that. Uh, to be honest, the air travel, I've got very little sympathy for. We've learned how to live without it uh, in the last year. It's a two generation old habit to get into flying. So we know we can adapt on that. But with global supply chains, shifting away from sea freight is going to be challenging. 
Uh, we can use rail freight provided it's electric, but that is going to be a significant change in the way we live. Half of the UK's food is currently imported mainly by sea, and we're going to have to think very hard about how we do things differently there. So if we go to the next slide, this is a picture of what it might look like in 2050 after electrification. So the Sankey diagram as drawn shows if we electrified everything we think we're going to want, and you can see that that leads to around about uh, double the amount of electricity that we're actually going to be able to have from what we're planning to generate. Um, but there are electric substitutes here for all of the vehicle types that we need. Now, um, because we need, um, there's too much uh, electricity demand there, we're going to have to start trading off our options for how we learn to make less electricity. So one of the things we're working on, and I was going to show you, but I, um, I've just given you a screen snapshot on the next screen, is a calculator we're doing here to show the trade-offs. So the graph, um, there, there's a website we're developing and we'll be able to uh, share this with you quite soon when it's launched. Um, and what this does is to show how you could modify vehicle designs or vehicle use in order to bring down that total electricity demand. So for example, we can shift modes, shifting from car to bus or car to uh, bicycle. We can change our demand for public transport by working from home as we've learned to do in the last year. We can change the demand for freight by better vehicle occupancy. Uh, we can use all of our vehicles more intensively or we could make them efficient, more efficient essentially by making them smaller. So what the calculator allows you to trade off all of those different options. And the solution I put there is that if we increased all vehicles occupancy to about 90%, halved the weights of cars and packed everything with regenerative braking, we could just about get to um, the electricity supply that we expect to have. So is that the end of life as we know it? No. Can we still make friends and go on car journeys? Yes. In fact, we're going to make more friends because we're going to need to share uh, more of the seats in the car to make it worth using the car uh, when we have a limited electricity budget. Could we survive in cars that weigh half as much as they do today? Well, of course we could. When I was a PhD student, my car weighed 700 kilograms and the average car being sold in the UK at the moment weighs 1,450 uh, kilograms. So just going back to the Peugeot 205 from the mid 1980s would be enough to get us back to uh, that car weight. Um, in order to try and give this uh, reality, I'm nearly at the end uh, now, we've been running a series of sector workshops across all the sectors we care about, and the, one of them recently has been on transport. Again, because this is a uh, work in progress and the session's being recorded, I can't tell you as much as I'd intended about that. Um, but we gathered together people, representatives from all across the industry, I think they're summarised on the next um, slide, here to, um, to get people together to look at this problem of energy restraint and say who could grow as we face up to the fact that we aren't going to have as much energy as we want in the transport sector. And they came up with a range of themes here, all of which we're now trying to elucidate as business growth opportunities in the UK. So very briefly, those include obviously electrification and technical efficiency, that's a sort of given. Um, but the interesting ones are things like mixing passenger and freight, particularly in rail. Uh, trains have an occupancy of something like 25% outside peak hours. Um, and at the moment, passenger trains and freight trains are entirely separate. There's a very obvious opportunity to be had there if we use the trains more intelligently to mix people and freight together. Um, obviously, mode shift and thinking of point-to-point -point journeys using an app. We've got Google Maps to plan the distance, but a variant of that could give us a ticket which connected together whatever was available, whether it's somebody in our street who's going to do some of the journey with a spare seat in their car, whether it's a, a train with some spare capacity or a bus um, or an electric bike or whatever it is. You can imagine that you could make money out of connecting all those options together to come up with the lowest energy means to get from A to B at this particular time. Um, there are a lot of interesting options for reducing mileage rather than all of us going to the supermarket. Can we have the supermarket come to us in some sense by mixing up virtual shopping with 
uh, a single delivery round. Um, and that's been a characteristic of lockdown, hasn't it? That we're all getting massives of deliveries per day from vehicles which each deliver a tiny parcel to us. So a bit of integration there is going to be quite effective in increasing vehicle occupancy. Moving from individual to shared use of capacity in all forms of vehicles has a whole range of different uh, opportunities as well. And we know there are some big opportunities in changing the topologies of transport networks, thinking of different forms of hub and smoke model so that we can make better use of the capacity that we have. So all of that we are currently writing up. We're going through further workshops with the uh, very many companies that are working with us on this. And we'll be publishing our report in the autumn. And I'm very keen to share that and make sure that it's complementary to what we, what the, the greenhouse activity is doing as well. Thanks very much for that. I'm really looking forward to the discussion later on. Thank you very much, Julian. And that was a very clear-eyed uh comprehensible and comprehensive um, coverage of, of where we are. And I have to say, um, I quite like the idea of mixing passengers and freight on trains. I'm having a bit of a flashback to um, uh, you know, historic pictures of milk churns being loaded onto um, under passenger trains into a good vehicle. And I particularly liked your uh, a a aircraft is essentially a Bunsen burner. I may borrow that one. You might hear that in the House of Lords sometime soon. So we now move on to our next speaker. Jonathan Essex is a chartered engineer and environmentalist. He's worked for engineering consultants and contractors in the UK, Bangladesh and Vietnam. His works included developing strategies for a social enterprise eco park, promoting material reuse. And I have to say Jonathan is my go-to person if I have any questions about what I should say about uh, issues around material reuse. Uh, and decarbonising the UK construction and housing industries. He's also a Green Councillor in Surrey. And so he's going to be introducing key findings for Greenhouse's forthcoming report on the UK and EU investment in transport infrastructure. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do really today is just talk a little bit about how, hopefully complementary to what Julian has just gone through, um, currently in the UK, we, we talk about climate change, but we are continuing to invest in in transport growth in a way that is going to frustrate uh, at best our, our, our attempts to do anything about it. So um, this slide just introduces a report we produced a couple of years ago which says we, we need to be honest about climate change. Hope is going to be grounded in action that's good enough to get to where we need to go, not wishful thinking based on continuing to head in, in the same direction. So move on to the next one. Um, and, and, and while we, we are honest about climate change, we, we've also got to be honest about the situation on decarbonising difficult to reach sect sectors and, and, and Julian has pretty much gone over all of this. I mean this is a huge part of the current emissions globally and a huge part of, of the emissions we, we have in the UK and, and building transport infrastructure both requires these kind of materials to construct the bridges and the roads and the railways which we aspire to have more of but also um, we, we then burn carbon in, in using those forms of transport such as aviation and shipping and HGVs in particular, so moving on. So this is just summarising where we are now. Um, so just whizzing through this slide, we, we don't have any targets currently on international aviation and shipping. Um, we're achieving a slower rate of reduction in the transport sector in the UK than in other sectors. Um, so transport is lagging the overall um, reduction in carbon emissions we have in the UK and globally. And the result is, you know, transport in investment is continuing to drive a process of centralization and globalization and global supply chains while at the same time we're trying to decarbonize and localize the rest of the economy. So th this presentation really um, could be summarized as uh, you know, how we worship the, go the god of Janus, uh, the god of cl current climate and economic policies that allows us to uh, face uh, in opposite directions at the same time in terms of our policy direction so next slide please so so this is just looking at, at where we are uh, now in terms of transport infrastructure investment but first a question so you know the UK's territorial emissions have fell um, although the consumption emissions not quite as much but which sectors actually went up in in that period 1990 2018 and the answer um, Transport carbon emissions were up 11%, but the detail, aviation up 124%, freight up by road by 
and and what I'm going to explore in the rest of this presentation is why that might be. So we've explored what the current investment appetites are in the different transport sectors in the UK, and then how that relates to our climate ambition. So next slide, please. So first, the aviation. This is just three bullet points as to what's been happening in the last year. So the Supreme Court has uh, dictated that government policy means that Heathrow um, can e expand on climate grounds, but yet soon after that, um, the UK government said that we should include aviation and shipping within tighter carbon reduction targets. And then just after agreeing that, the government then granted appeal for yet another airport Stansted to ex expand while still not having an overarching national um, aviation strategy. So at the same time, we're talking about more stringent carbon reduction pathways, um, including for aviation shipping, but we're continuing to permit growth of our aviation capacity. Next slide, please. The detail of that we've analysed. Um, by 2030, every UK airport plans to expand and collectively so that passenger numbers can increase by 50%. And just keep going down this one. COVID hasn't dented the expansion plans. Um, just 78% of this increase would require £20 billion of private sector spending by the airport owners. And that requires road and rail spending. Um, so what that does is, is force us to direct our road and rail spending across the UK to allow expansion of, of key nodes, such as airports and ports. Heathrow, £16 billion of surface transport investment estimated by TfL. Just contrast that to the level of ambition for changing modes and, and reducing our propensity to move. Um, walking and cycling, £2 billion. Bus revolution, um, uh, talked about by the government's three billion, very much smaller numbers than just the infrastructure needed to allow our biggest airport to expand. Next slide. So moving on to rail. Here, just contrasting two things. On the one hand, Network Rail has commissioned a plan that would say decarbonising the rail network would cost between 18 and 26 billion, but then produced a five-year plan, which is largely um, 42 billion pounds in value, but doesn't have really any, any of that decarbonisation strategy embedded in it. On top of that, we've got um, separate investments to expand our, our two biggest uh, uh, investments, Crossrail and HS2, which together um, would pay for that network decarbonisation five times over. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're gearing rail growth through specific projects which increase long distance travel, perhaps a modal shift from flying, short haul at least, uh, and, and make it easier to commute to London from further away. But we are, haven't got that regional or local modal shift and that network wide decarbonisation yet taking place. Next slide. Um, freight. So this is, this is, if you like, summar summarising up where we are in terms of ports, but also airports. And for think, when you think port, think free port is the latest terminology. So there are eight port, free ports defined now by the government. Uh, one is East Midlands Airport, which sits at the heart of what's called the Golden Triangle, the place in the UK from which you can, you can truck to 90% of, of our population within four hours uh, lorry uh, driving. And, and then the rest is our five biggest ports are among those free ports. So what we are doing is making it easier to send more stuff further away um, by incentivizing that aviation and that shipping movement. Um, and the average tonne of UK non-EU trade is five times the average of all uh, tonnes of trade we have with the EU. So the, the, the carbon emissions to sh shift our our trade internationally is much more when we ship it or fly it to further away than with the UK, I think it, UK, EU. An example of that is the recent Australia, UK trade deal, which proposes a 1600% uh, increase in Australian lamb exports. Clearly, if we receive more lamb from Australia rather than from Wales, it has a, a lower um, think of what it has a lower of, but it certainly has a higher um, transport carbon footprint. Um, and, and that's the current trend. So while we talk about, you know, bringing aviation and shipping within the limits of the carbon budget, we are, we are making that um, the growth continue. Next slide. Okay, so, so there are our challenges to that, the Transport Action Network, uh, 
in the UK has got a legal challenge on highway England's road building plans and the Aviation Environmental Federation has called for moratorium on airport growth. But I think we need more in that area if we are really going to challenge this hypocrisy between saying one thing and doing the opposite. Next slide. So just to, to look a little bit about what's happening in, in, in Europe. E Europe has increased its transport carbon emissions uh, by around a third since to, uh, uh, 1990. And, and that now stands at over a billion tonnes of carbon emissions every single year. Um, now, while climate change is being talked about in various strategies and plans, there is still massive growth proposed. And, and the key example I would like to flag for that is something called the Trans-European Transport Network, or TENT, of which HS2 is indeed a part. And, and that's, you know, the numbers here are astonishing. This, this, just the core network, which is planned to be completed by 2030 at a cost of a further 500 billion euros estimated just in the last year or so, uh, th this is talking about, you know, improving 13% of 63 thousand kilometers of rail, you know, 5% of 47, 48,000 kilometers of roads. These are massive amounts of infrastructure investment um, to get to this ideal that somehow um, making uh, these transport routes bigger, increasing their capacity is what we need. And we can do that somehow in parallel to carbon reduction, um, the European Green Deal climate commitments. So next slide, please. There was a recently published review of this investment and it showed that the current plans to expand transport infrastructure would mean that we would fail to meet the European Green Deal's climate targets. Um, the review says sustainability requires adjusted targets and requirements. Well, that's a very nice way of putting it. it's not good enough. Um, they also said um, that there are more petrol stations. In fact, there's twice as many petrol stations along every kilometre of road in the core network across Europe as there are electric car charging points. So even the idea of shifting to electric, you know, it's, it's not gonna happen with the current uh, growth, the current trajectory. Next slide. And linked to that, those transport modes, most of these corridors either start or end at an airport or a port. The European Seaports Association estimate 48 billion by the end of this decade is required in euros to complete their efforts. Um, and, and the flights, you know, 60% of aviation emissions across Europe were due to flights that were more than a thousand kilometers long. So it's not going to be just a, a bit of modal shift on, on short haul flights to, to trains and, and, and road. We need to really change behavior across Europe if we're going to bring this together. Next slide. So just in conclusion, uh, my pitch to you is, is that, you know, we've for a long time um, talked about how we predict and provide growth. We've done that for cars. We really need to do it uh, and deliver the outcome. So next slide. Um, we, we've talked in our in our toolkit, which we've produced in Greenhouse, what are the political blockers and the political enablers we need to shift the decision making? So the climate talk uh, and, and the transport invest, investment finally match each other. And next slide. Uh, so we really need to talk about climate and trade in the same sentence. We can't talk about growth in airports ports, road networks and rail based on a global trade ambition in one sentence and then have a separate article on maybe the other side of the same newspaper talking about the Paris climate talks. That's not good enough. Next slide. So shifting from transport, climate and globalisation, what we really need to do is stop investing in new capacity for transport infrastructure and instead shift how we use the existing capacity better instead, shifting our modes using more for more local journeys. And, and rather than having slower actual um, reduction for transport emissions than the other sectors, if we're going to localize our economy, we need to have faster reduction targets for transport sector than for other sectors. So what that will do is then the transport can then drive localization, the demand reduction that Julian talked about to enable the other, the other sectors in turn to change. So next slide. So what I'm suggesting in a graph is this. Um, think about the low carbon activities and the high carbon activities. The low carbon from A to B and then the high carbon can go on and on as much as you like to burn fossil fuels. We really need to reduce our emission within limit, which means we need to eliminate high carbon activities so that we can afford to invest in the lower carbon ones. Next slide, please. So it's a bit like this, which is an image of what degrowth might look like in cartoon form. 
currently we have an elephant sized economy that is either talked about as either growing, stagnating or receding. In terms of transport, I would argue we need to shift from elephant to snail. And why snail? Because that would mean that the total um, scale of transport would be smaller. Um, snails don't travel as fast, so it'd be slower. And they don't travel as far as elephants either. So we, we would localize, we reduce our distances. And finally, although the snail has a shell on its back, it can carry far less than an elephant. So perhaps we might reduce our freight as well as our passengers' uh, movements at the same time. And I think that's close to the end. Next slide. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And um, uh, I think there was a huge amount of food for thought in there, although I think perhaps we want to find a different animal to a snail. I was trying to think of a nice sort of cuddly but slow moving animal, um, perhaps something for the for the Q&A or the chat box. Um, and just a reminder that we're um, uh, we will be coming to a Q&A session at the end. Uh, we'll be hearing from our next speaker first. And just while you're doing that, I'll just reflect a little bit on what Jonathan was saying, because he was saying what needs to be done. But I think it's also important we suggest, stress the positives of what doing these kinds of things could achieve. Um, we've long talked as Greens with a small G and big G about the need for strong local economies in which money goes round and round in local economies. And that also means the goods stay local as well. And that's huge numbers of opportunities for local food growing, local food production, local manufacture of chairs and tables from, you know, ideally from recycled materials. Um, there's a huge amount of possibility of creating a differently structured economy with that. So now we move on to our next speaker, um, who's Andrew Murphy, Director of Aviation for Transport and Environment. And I think it's to my discredit that it was only, I think, when I was at the Bond Climate Talks that I got introduced to transport and environment. But it's actually an absolutely brilliant NGO um, in um, Europe that does, um, well, as my piece of paper in front of me says, the leading green, the leading clean transport campaign group. Andrew's previously worked as a project manager at the Green European Foundation, and he's a board member of Ireland's Climate Change Advisory Council. And so Andrew's going to be specifically focusing on moving on from our poll question on what car zero carbon means for aviation. So over to you, Andrew. Hi, thanks, Natalie, and thanks everyone, and thanks for this invitation. As I'll explain, um, I mean, my answer to that poll would have been some of the above uh, and a few options that weren't on that poll. Um, it's a little difficult to follow uh, the two previous speakers uh, because, you know, they said um, some very strong points uh, on aviation points, which I can either agree with, and I do agree with them in, in points, uh, in which case it will be somewhat repetitive and un uninteresting, um, or I could sort of disagree and, and, and outline where I adopt a slightly different position, um, which is what I'll do, uh, not in a sort of cantankerous manner, but because I think there's a few more points uh, we can add on uh, to the points that have been made. Um, thank you, Natalie, for the introduction. Um, what she left out was that, I, well, she mentioned I worked for the Green European Foundation. It was the first uh, job I had when I moved to Brussels. So very grateful for Jeff for giving me my start in the European space. And um, <clears throat> rather echoey, hard to hear. Not sure how to address that. Um, perhaps if I just try and speak a bit more clearly. Um, so as I was saying, um, started off in Brussels working for Jeff. It was Leonora Gwesler who hired me, who's now um, doing great things as Austria's transport and climate minister. Um, seven years I've been working on aviation at TNE. So, you know, I can't come here and claim it's been an enormous success. Um, up for most of that period, until the last year, aviation missions continued to grow. Um, governments haven't put in place. Um, the sort of measures that are needed. There is no immediate technology that's being rapidly deployed. Uh, but that being said, you know, some things have changed and some lessons have been learned from other transport sectors that I think are quite relevant to the discussion around aviation. The first point I'd, I'd say where things have changed is there, you know, aviation is no longer ignored as a climate driver as it once was. Um, the aviation sector no longer rolls out more fuel efficient aircraft and says this is enough. Governments, particularly the UK government, no longer says, well, we'll just rely on this UN agency, ICAO, to produce um, offsetting programs and that will do. 
Uh, so we are seeing this is greater pressure. We are seeing industry and airlines adopt targets, their own targets, but of course, targets for 2050 uh, and still resisting more stronger targets in 2030. So we're shifting, I think, in the discussion around aviation. People are discussing that you know, we don't need to fly as much as we do. Uh, Greta has obviously started that conversation. COVID-19 has turbocharged that conversation. So things are moving, but things are moving at a very glacial pace and certainly not um, in a manner um, that is consistent with what we need for Paris. So we look at the aviation sector and we ask ourselves um, what solutions exist. And in many respects, you know, the solutions aren't here now and they won't be available in significant quantities for many years. So we dismiss the technical solutions and we say, well, this isn't going to work. It's techno optimism, you're misleading people. We just need to fly less. And to that, I would say, you know, 50% partly right. For the next few years, um, flying less, flying not at all, um, is the most effective way to reduce emissions. There is no quantity of alternative fuels. There are no zero emission aircraft that can be deployed at scale within the next few years that can meaningfully reduce aviation emissions, certainly not to the same extent that simply not flying will do. Um, but then we look more to the long term, and then we get into questions around techno-optimism and how much we want to fly. And so the first point on techno-optimism, and I think most of the time when people talk about techno-optimism, they do it in sort of a disparaging way, and they say, well, you're just being a techno-optimist, you're relying on some technology to solve the problem. And of course, the problem with that dismissive attitude, as, as legitimate as it is sometimes, is it does overlook the time when the optimists have been proven right. And I think a good example of this is to look at the electrification in the road transport sector. Because up until a few years ago, there was a huge amount of skepticism around um, electric vehicles, rooted in the idea that batteries will always be too expensive. Um, the grid will always be too much powered by coal. Um, and they sort of dismissed electric vehicles and said, well, look, the solution is we just need to, you know, invest in public transport, people need to give up their car. We have seen the optimists prove right. We've seen the cost of batteries decrease. We've seen um, European, Californian regulations drive an uptake of electric vehicles. And that techno optimism has resulted in falling um, oil demand in the road transport sector, a very recent development, a development that's a little too late a little too slow, but the optim techno optimism has paid off there and it has um, is starting to bring about a reduction in fossil oil demand in the road transport sector. So what can we take from that experience to the aviation sector? What technology, what optimism can we apply to the aviation sector and how can we actually reduce aviation emissions? And I think we should apply optimism to the aviation sector because I think flying for a conference for one day I think flying for three holidays um, a year, a ski holiday, a sun holiday, a city break, I don't think that's defensible. I think 1% of people um, being responsible for 50% of aviation emissions is an indictment of how unequal uh, the drivers of climate change are. But is it a case that we, we don't want flying at all? Um, do we want to remain completely disconnected? Um, I think there is a case to be made that we do want aviation in the future. And, you know, we can look back in the last year and say people have survived without, without flying. People have survived, but people have also suffered hardship as a result of an inability to fly. I work for a very international environment where people, some people, myself included, I'm not seeing our families for 12, 18 months. Um, connecting people by flights is a good thing. And being able to travel across continents is a good thing. So what is the optimism we can apply to aviation? Well, the first bit of optimism we can do is I think we should stop referring to aviation and shipping as sectors which are difficult to decarbonize. You know, I think that phrase, difficult to decarbonize, tends to be a very industry favorite phrase because what it says is it's too difficult, don't try and do it, don't regulate us, don't expect us to reduce our emissions. Our emissions will keep on growing, because our, mission, our sector is hard to decarbonize. So firstly, we should drop, set that aside. Any sector can be decarbonized. You just need to take the fossil fuels out of it. So what does taking the fossil fuels out of aviation look like? 
Um, Crop-based biofuels, no, uh, because they will compete with land, they will drive deforestation. Um, instead, one solution um, is developing new fuels known as synthetic kerosene. I guess um, you would describe synthetic kerosene as potentially the most optimistic of all technologies, because as one of the previous speakers referred to, it requires an enormous amount of renewable electricity. Um, how much renewable electricity depends on how much we intend to fly in the future. Um, the more we want to fly, the more we want to binge travel, the more renewable electricity we will need. But we have done some of the analysis, and in the long run, not tomorrow, in the long run, we can generate enough renewable electricity to decarbonize aviation, so long as we do certain things now, such as not expand airport capacity, not make that job harder by building more runways and building more aircraft. We need to start the job now by investing in renewable electricity and beginning the production of these e-fuels. Um, we need, of course, also to introduce government regulations. And on Wednesday, uh, the EU will publish its Refuel EU initiative. Um, a leaked version was made available a few hours ago. The EU will start regulating the CO2 content of jet fuel, and it will start driving down the CO2 content by mandating a small amount of e-kerosene, um, less than 1% in 2030, um, and scale it up from 2035 to 2040 to 2045 to 2050. Um, I think we should be ambitious about trying to have a decarbonized aviation sector in 2040 and 2050. I think we should do that because I think it's good to fly. And I think we should do that because, you know, people are going to fly. Um, it's a small number to date who have admirably given up um, flying, but they are a minority and they will remain a minority. Um, we should be ambitious of what we can achieve. Um, and we should communicate a rather complicated message, which is there is a path to decarbonizing aviation in the long run. It begins now with investments and it will cause aviation to be more expensive, but it can be pursued and it should be pursued. But until those measures are rolled out at, at scale, flying less remains um, the most effective way to reduce your own CO2 emissions should you be somebody who flies. And multiple flyers, large corporate flyers um, should all take the lead or you know tax measures should be introduced which can bring about uh, a reduction in their in their flying habits so i mean i don't don't totally disagree with what the previous speaker said i don't 100 percent agree with what they said um i think it's it's a fair contest i think ultimately it comes down to what value we attach to flying both as individuals and the value we think it brings to society and to economies if you're an individual who is you know, less optimistic about our develop ability to develop new technologies and is skeptical of the benefits that flying brings, I think it's a perfectly legitimate um, point to make that it's all techno-optimism in the worst sense and it shouldn't be pursued. I would describe myself as um, optimistic. I think optimism has been proven right in some respects. And I do attach a value, social and economic, um, to flying. And um, I recognize that benefit. And I, I think we as a society should, should introduce the measures which can bring about uh, a reduction in emissions in aviation over time. So I'm, I'm happy to be um, critiqued on, on my position. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I know I may be proven wrong. Uh, I know advocating for these technologies um, can be used by industry to say there is a solution, the problem is here. The solution is here, there is no problem. Um, so, you know, have as many flights as you want, because, uh, yeah, in a few years time, there'll be different fuels, so do what you want. Um, I, I, I accept that, that's a risk, uh, but as I said, I, I, I'm an optimist and I see value in flying. So that's my contribution to the discussion. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions and, and to be engaged in this discussion. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, and um, I'm glad to see that we haven't got 100% agreement across the panel because that's always makes the job of the chair rather dull. It's good to have some uh, some uh, discussion as well. And so, just a reminder, now's a really good time if you haven't put your question in the Q and A box. Uh, now would be a great time to do it to make sure that we get to it. I think a good. I'm going to come to all the the questions in the Q and A boxes in the moment, but I think perhaps because we have had two quite different ideas presented here in terms of flying. Perhaps, um, Julian, if I can come to you first, and perhaps if you can just react to what Andrew said, and, and indeed, Jonathan, you might like to too, but I'll come to Julian first um, about how that fits with your perspective, the idea 
that you know some people will want us to keep flying and you know i think of some obvious examples um was actually when protesters blocked um uh stansted airport and you know one of the very upset people on the on the radio was someone who'd been on their way to their father's funeral i think it's pretty hard to to argue to stop things like that so perhaps um julian if you'd like to respond uh to andrew's presentation yeah thanks very much natalie um and of course it's incredibly helpful to hear uh different languages being brought to this discussion i value that immensely um th on the specific then andrew said that uh, techno optimists have been proved right, and he used the example of electric cars. The electric car was invented more than 100 years ago. We actually had it before the petrol engine car. And the advantage of Zoom meetings is I could Google a bit of data there. The global sales in 2019 was 2.5% of new car sales, and it was up to 4.2% in 2020. So the growth rate is still less than the threshold I said uh, of 2% per year growth. I was talking about energy infrastructure technologies, not about energy demand technologies. So I think I can imagine that the electric car is going to go faster, um, primarily actually because the car companies have all stopped developing new combustion engines. They want the security and the certainty of knowing the way the market's going to develop. So oddly, it was them in the end that were lobbying for electric cars so that they knew what was going to happen. But I don't buy that that's a proof that electric aeroplanes are going to turn up out of nowhere. Uh, Andrew's statement was we should be ambitious and have a decarbonised aviation sector by 2040 or maybe 2050. And I can hear that statement absolutely everywhere. In the Lord's debate, then uh, we had plenty of people telling me that we had to be ambitious and that there was um, all I should stop being pessimistic. We should just be more ambitious and things would turn up. Well, I'm afraid I'm a realist and I'm ambitious in the sense of wanting us to get to zero emissions so we have a safe uh, planet. We will not have the amount of non-emitting electricity required to make any significant aviation fuel. So sure, we can have a small amount of aviation, but it's going to be so expensive. The trade-off is, do we want 200 poor people in the north of England to have no heating all winter so that one rich person can make a luxury flight once during the year. It's that kind of trade-off and we're not going to buy it whatsoever. So I agree that in transition, uh, dealing with compassionate reasons to fly is uh, absolutely crucial. Um, and the last flight you would hope is precisely for somebody to go and visit a dying relative. Um, we couldn't fly until two generations ago. So it's a short-term habit that we've picked up that we live that way. Uh, we've got a generation, generation and a half in order to get out of it again. Uh, we don't have any options to have mass flying in 30 years time. Okay, I'm going to put that same question to Jonathan, although I'm also going to throw in a question in the Q&A from um, Neil um, Pitkin um, from Greenpeace Surrey. Um, we've been talking particularly about sort of UK and Europe, but Neil asks what policy levers can we use to persuade countries in Asia, the Middle East and Africa to rein back on aviation expansion? while at the same time maintaining some form of economic development with social benefits. So perhaps if you, if you could pick up any, any response to Andrew, um, Jonathan, and also pick up that sort of international perspective. I think I've got a different concern about techno optimism, which is that I find that quite often it's a convenient cover for business as usual. So we talk about optimism about what might happen in the future, and that makes it difficult for mainstream change in terms of how we, we behave ourselves, which makes it hard for, to have the integrity to challenge um, government to, to take a different approach. So while we have techno-optimism, if you like, for aviation, um, a airports continue to expand. Um, we don't have to change now because we still imagine it's possible to change in the future and oh we've got a carbon target as well so we can feel good about not changing now because we've committed to a, a future carbon reduction target I, I think we need to I, th I think the public need to accept that climate scientists are the ones who know about climate change and and maybe debating whether we're optimistic or not about technologies maybe we should just rely on what's available for us to use now and make different choices. In, in terms of overseas development, um, my, my first pitch would be, um, let's see how we invest our aid overseas. Um, do we incentivize countries um, to follow our pattern of development or do we incentivize them to leap, leapfrog our increasingly focused on you know, flying 
shipping international trade so you know is is the aid which we have with the country you're talking about linked to a trade deal for example and for that matter um, are we expecting that country to continue to export fossil fuels to us or indeed uh, nickel to, to make batteries for our electric cars Thanks very much, Jonathan. I'm going to try and put together a number of, of questions here. Um, several people, including Reinhardt uh, and Peter, have asked about airships, which you might describe as a kind of techno optimism. And someone asked about uh, freight driven by, by uh, wind, which is, apologies, I've currently lost where that question was. Um, and I think also, I mean, in terms of um, alternatives to flying in Europe, I don't think anyone's really mentioned night trains yet, which is one of my little pet subjects of my own, if I can bring that in. Um, so perhaps, um, Andrew, if I can come to you with some of those sort of alternative technology type questions, um, and also if there's anything you want to say in response to what the other two said. Um, I think I think on the issue of you know technology versus not expanding aviation, I think the UK Climate Change Committee has got it very correct um, when they say that we need to put a hold on any expansion until new technology has been deployed. And I think that's that's the right approach to be deployed. We, you know the sector is behind other sectors in decarbonizing. On um, how exactly you know we bring about new technology, it, it never comes about because industry sort of sees the writing on the wall or has an awakening and says, this is what I'll do. Um, it happens because, um, it happens because um, governments move in and introduce regulations. And this is what's happening in the e-vehicles sector for cars. It was binding regulations in the EU, EU and California, which is increasing from 2% to 4% to 10% the share of EV sales. Um, do we have enough renewables available? You know, that's an area of contestation, whether by 2040, 2050, you can rapidly scale up um, offshore wind, um, wind elsewhere that we can uh, use for juicy fuels. Um, on the availability of new technology, I mean, diving into what it takes to introduce new technology in aviation, um, the, um, the issue is that the aviation sector is very, very conservative and new technology is very hard to introduce because um, people hold the aviation sector to a very high standard when it comes to safety. They tend not to like um, aircraft falling out of the sky. Uh, and so drop in fuels off the tide with e-kerosene. So I, I don't think electric um, aviation where we put batteries in aircraft is a particularly viable option. Um, I think batteries are, are too heavy and I think the safety requirements are too difficult. Um, airships, um, you know, tend to be quite slow. Uh, and can carry the mass of passengers in the way that um, jet engines can. So that is the, um, you know, that's uh, a, a, a sort of a discourse on some of the te technical barriers uh, to decarbonizing aviation. Thanks very much. Um, and I'm going to, um, the airships and the wind for freight, I'm going to throw that also to Jonathan. Um, and also to pick up another question in the Q&A um, from um, Sarah Clayton, which points out that the debate about carbon and transport too often ignores the importance of the, the devastation of the natural world and declining biodiversity. Indeed, I had a piece in um, The Ecologist recently about um, mining, mining and the destructiveness of mining. Um, many technologies, for example, low carbon electricity depend on rare earth minerals. Um, and so how do we tackle that aspect of you know, potential changes in transport? Also, perhaps picking up the airships and the, um, uh, and the wind powered freight, Jonathan, if I can come to you. Am I off mute? Yes, I think so. Um, I think it's a lot of it's about speed. Um, I'm not sure that airships travel as fast as, as airplanes. So, you know, if, if, you, if you have Love Island introduces a, a new dress of the week and sticks it on Instagram and then wants to, to fly in the, f the fast fashion, it may not arrive as quickly as the demand requires on a, on a, on a Zeppelin as on a 737. Um, and, and, and similarly, you know, if, if our culture has shifted from bananas, which are shipped to the UK, um, used to be a luxury uh, a, a generation ago, to the luxury being called a mango, a fruit that doesn't doesn't last that long from pick to eat, then again, a, a Zeppelin wouldn't work in that regard. So I, I think the first question is, is to think maybe not so much about the form of transport being shifted from a plane to a ship, but if, if you're changing the speed of the travel, 
then we might also need to change the nature and, and the scale of which we we move things around so i think it might be first first to look at what we fly and and, and that means that we really need to change the, the notion that trade can be free trade where there is no limits to what is flown in and out of a country that there are no carbon taxes at borders that anyone can do whatever they want as long as it fits in with their their framework of, of, of making money from 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 what they do so I, I think that the for me that the zeppelins question opens up a much wider set of questions well thank you very much and i i'm going to come back to julian with um the kind of uh, what you might describe as the tricky question sitting here in the q a box which is from william shoot of heading the green party um, how can there be any hope of meeting zero carbon requirements without widespread agreement on the need to curb the profit motive and with it capitalism as we know it? So just just a uh, final question, Julian, to, to hand over to you is, is an interesting one. Yeah, no trouble. And would it be OK if I dealt with world peace and the future of uh, contemporary music as well at the same time? Oh, de definitely. You know, tell us what the next number one is going to be. <laughs> Good. Uh, I I have no training in um, the design of political structures, so I can't help with that. I think the uh, opportunity that we are trying to um, degrowth has been around for twenty years as an agenda, um, and it's just so difficult to sell um, that even if it is a consequence of what we're talking about, I'm not sure it's a useful way of trying to accelerate change. Um, the way that growth is discussed at the moment depends on um, the notion of an equilibrium in economics. Uh, and so the Stern report talks about things using a model which is based on an adjustment to that notional equilibrium. Um, but actually, what we're talking about here isn't an equilibrium, it's a shock. And it's actually extremely difficult for us to work out what that's going to do to prices. So I don't know whether the economy is going to grow or expand, but I do think that we in a real zero emissions future in 29 years time, will be there applying ourselves, our efforts and our creativity to try and uh, sustain great lives in whatever way we define them at the time. So I think the, the view that we've taken in the activity I lead is trying to see which businesses could grow. And that's quite fun. So for example, um, one of the things that Andrew said that I'm afraid was wrong was any sector can be decarbonized. So one sector that cannot be decarbonized is the cement sector. There are currently in the world no options for making cement with no emissions because it's the chemistry, it's not the heat, it's the problem. But we are going to want to make and repair buildings. So how do you attach buildings to the ground without cement? But it turns out there's some interesting options for doing that. Of course, we used to do that. All the world's cathedrals, the old cathedrals are attached to the ground without cement. But there are screw piles, there's rammed earth, there's ways of using different forms of raft or spread out foundations. And somebody's going to be a big winner on that. The way that we build is going to change. We aren't going to have any access to cement, but we want to go to keep building. So if we can stimulate the businesses that are going to prosper when that reality comes, that actually makes it easier for the government to start putting in the regulation that would accelerate the change. Because rather than saying you've got to ban the cement industry, which is true, what we could say is here is a brilliant growth group who found the ways to pin structures to the ground and repair them. And with this regulation, you would allow this UK company to grow. And that's, I think, a very much more um, proactive or positive story that politicians feel able to engage with, given the, the five year election cycle. Um, so I think uh, my version of optimism at the moment is to try and identify the sectors that will definitely be able to grow and almost then not to talk about the ones like the fossil fuel sunset sectors that have to disappear um, completely. Okay, and I think from the chair, I'm going to um, just throw in a couple of books to, um, a, which is perhaps a more appropriate format to try and answer that question, which is, of course, um, Kate, Kate Raworth's um, uh, 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 donut economics and um, the other one I, I suggest is many people will know Tim Jackson from Prosperity Without Growth but he has a new post growth out which people might like to read so sadly I'm sure we could keep going all evening but we can't do that we're just about out of time so I'm going to hand back through our speakers in reverse order so starting um, with Andrew then Jonathan then Julian for a final word just about a minute if you can about 
anything to wrap up, anything you'd like to finally say, um, anything out from left field you think's worth throwing into the mix before we finish for this evening? So over to you, Andrew, to start off with. Thanks. Um, I hope um, all of us on this panel um, stay healthy for years to come so we can see in 20 or 30 years' time um, who was the optimist and who was the pessimist. Um, I fully support uh, the need to, for everyone to fly less, for airport expansion to be stopped. Um, but I don't see aviation as a sunset industry. Um, I see aviation as an industry which will be in place many years to come. And I think it's an obligation of governments to put in place the sort of measures that can see that the, the emissions in that sector be brought to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for being very brief. Uh, I Mr. Jonathan. Thank you. Um, I think we should call out investment in growing the scale of transport as irresponsible investment. It's highly risky to invest in infrastructure that most likely will end up in an increase in carbon emissions when it's time to reduce it. And, and I think what this is also doing is crowding out the space to really think and explore what zero carbon transport looks like and to plan to make it happen. So um, calling it irresponsible investment would be my final word. Thank you very much. And we're doing really well on timing. Finally, Julian, you get the final word. Uh, thank you. One thing that none of us has talked about yet is um, that there is a missing mechanism in the UK, very obviously, that we've got targets, we've got an advisory body, but we have no delivery authority. So I think the single biggest thing missing in politics is a delivery authority which has cross-departmental influence at the level of the Treasury to ensure that the uh, forms of uh, incompatibility that Jonathan has articulated so well are impossible. And I'd have thought a change, um, a delivery authority that really had teeth, combined with the change in the way that National Audit Office works, might become a very powerful lever for bringing about the kind of change that we're talking about. Uh, sounds like a great idea to me, I'd have to say. And um, uh, you were making me think as you were talking about how um, we've managed to, through work in the House of Lords in two successive finance bills, finally managed to get some mention of the climate emergency in. And at the moment we're working on the skills and post 16 education bill. And yet again, we're pounding the government from all sides, including quite a few Tories saying, we need to mainstream the environment in everything we do. And that's something, you know, the government is a very long way from doing. So I think this has been a very um, informative, uh, fact-filled, graph-filled, um, and thought-provoking um, presentation. So I want to say, I'm sure on behalf of the whole of the audience, thank you very much uh, to our three speakers this evening. Um, you, you will have seen, if you've got the chat open, that there's um, links there if you'd like to sign up for newsletters um, from uh, the Green European Foundation and from the Greenhouse Think Tank. Uh, there's also, as the slide's telling you, um, a feedback survey there. I know they're not the biggest fun in the world, but I promise it's really short uh, and really quick. And it does really help people to be able to sort of show, uh, show your working as your maths teacher used to say. I think we still didn't manage to get onto night trains, which is a bit of a pity because that is one of my little pet subjects. Um, my furthest distance I've been on night trains has been to Finland, to Poland uh, and to Marrakesh. And so I reckon that's about the, um, the distance that one can fairly easily uh, travel by train. The problem is that I've had enough money to be able to do that. And um, at the moment, it's still relatively a very expensive way to travel compared to air. And there's some messages perhaps in there for that we haven't uh, covered this evening. But anyway, um, reminder about all the forms there in the chat. Um, if, you have, if you're on your phone or something and can't see the chat box, um, if you just Google Green European Foundation and Greenhouse Think Tank, um, you'll find very easily ways to, to sign up there. Uh, so I'll finish by wrapping up there. I think looking at my watch, we are absolutely on time, um, which is a bit of a miracle really, given the amount of ground we've covered. Uh, thank you everyone for all of the interesting discussion and questions that we had, the, the interaction in the chat box. And it was great to see everything from people who describe themselves as retired to people who describe themselves as students. I think we've had a good range of people engaged in this. So thank you very much to Greenhouse organisers, the Green European Foundation, um, and have a good evening, everyone.